So we're finally ready to see how the first isomorphism theorem gives us a way of understanding the structure of a group by looking at homomorphisms that come out of that group. The key ingredients so far that we've seen are the fact that the kernels of homomorphisms are normal subgroups of the domain, and also conversely that every normal subgroup of the domain is the kernel of some homomorphism out of that group. But what we're going to see next is that it's not just the kernel that plays an important role in characterizing structure. It's also the image of a homomorphism. The first isomorphism theorem establishes that not only is the kernel of phi a normal subgroup of G, but the image of phi as a subgroup of H, the target group, is isomorphic to the factor group of G by the kernel of phi. This is the key construction that we previously saw in a linear algebra metaphor as a way of saying if we can forget about the lack of one-to-oneness that comes from the existence of a non-trivial kernel to a homomorphism, if we can forget about all that and, and wave it away, then what we're really doing is we're focusing on the factor group of G by that kernel. And once we forget about that, our homomorphism becomes an isomorphism between the factor group of G by the kernel and the image of phi inside of H. First, we're going to return to the linear algebra metaphor to see where all this thinking fits in with our abstract algebra context. So I just want to take that linear algebra metaphor and just literally translate it over into the context of abstract algebra. So the linear algebra metaphor, if you remember, said that if I have a linear transformation from one vector space to another vector space, every linear transformation is secretly hiding an invertible linear transformation inside of itself. And the way that that worked was that the invertible linear transformation that we discover in linear algebra, it associates the row space in an invertible way onto the column space of our transformation. And the way that it did that is it had to take the kernel, the null space, everything which gets sent to the zero vector, and we had to forget about it in order to turn this non-invertible linear transformation into an invertible linear transformation. One of the ways we can think of it is if we just took this vector space and we squished away the kernel, we just projected the entire vector space or in an orthogonal way, in a way that makes the kernel exactly disappear, then in this picture we would squish everything down onto this green plane that we see down here. And once we do that, this linear transformation carries that green plane in a nice isomorphic one-to-one -one dimension preserving way onto the image of T inside of the target vector space over here on the right. So every linear transformation is hiding an invertible transformation, and the way to find it is by forgetting about the kernel, squishing away everything that the linear transformation sends to zero, and focusing on how it carries the remaining stuff onto the image inside of the target vector space, coming from this thing which I'm going to call the co-image, which in linear algebra we call the row space, back inside of the domain. So once we forget about the kernel, once we squish the kernel away, we're left with just the co-image. And this linear transformation carries the co-image in an invertible way onto the image inside of the target vector space. So that was the linear algebra content. We often call the rank nullity theorem in linear algebra, or sometimes thought of as the theorem of the four fundamental subspaces of a linear transformation. So how do we port that intuition over into abstract algebra to give us an idea of what the first isomorphism theorem is going to sound like? What's the content going to be here? Well, remember, the reason that this theorem worked in linear algebra is that the kernel is exactly the stuff that's getting sent to zero by this linear transformation. And that's why, in the end, the kernel doesn't matter somehow. Uh, because any differences between elements in the domain over here that are explained by differences that belong to this kernel, those differences are all getting erased by the action of this linear transformation because the differences are all getting zeroed out. So to port that into the abstract algebra context, we ask, what's the group theory analog to this? And in a real sense, the analog from group theory is actually kind of the reason for group theory. It's almost a generalization of the rank nullity theorem. Because after all, vector spaces are nothing more than abelian groups uh, that also happen to have some other structure associated with them as well. So we can think of the first isomorphism theorem as kind of a more general principle than the rank nullity theorem from linear algebra. So I'll replace my vector spaces with groups 
G and H. Replace my linear transformation with a homomorphism phi. And replace my invertible linear transformation with an isomorphism here. And replace the zero vector over here with the identity element of the group H. But all of this structure should still work because my homomorphism is going to be making all the elements in my kernel map to the identity element of H. And so any pair of elements in G whose difference belongs to that kernel are going to have the same image under phi because phi is erasing differences between elements when those differences belong to the kernel. And so what's playing the role of the row space from linear algebra is now the image of phi as a subgroup of H. What's playing the role of the co-image is the orthogonal complement from linear algebra. It's that stuff which didn't belong to the kernel, but which together with the kernel make up the entire original domain. That's now going to be the factor group of G by K. And so what we want our first isomorphism theorem to say is that every group homomorphism is hiding within itself an invertible group homomorphism. In other words, an isomorphism. And the way to find it is by factoring away, instead of forgetting, we're going to think of factoring out the kernel and thinking about the factor group, G mod K, onto the image coming from the co-image, and this co-image is the quotient group, factor group, G mod K. So the statement of the first isomorphism theorem is that if I have a homomorphism from G to H that might be doing some complicated stuff, not be one to one, not be on to, I can take a small step back from H and think about just the image of phi within H. That's this blue piece over here. If I just think about the image, now I would get something which is onto. So G to the image of phi is going to be onto. But that might not be one to one. I could fix it not being one to one by instead of thinking about all the elements of my domain group G as being different, I'm going to only think about them being different insofar as their difference might be an element of the kernel and instead think of the cosets of the kernel inside of G. If I think instead of the elements of G being individuals, think of them as being parts of cosets of the kernel. Now, every different element in the same coset of K is going to act exactly the same under this transformation because the differences are all going to get wiped out because all those differences are accounted for by elements of the kernel which phi erases. And that now is going to make a function which is not only onto the image of phi, but coming from the factor group by the kernel, is also going to be one to one. And in every step, we're preserving the operations of these groups. And so what we're going to get by taking a step forward from the domain and a step backwards from the target group and focusing on the factor group by the kernel and the image of phi, what we're going to get is one to one and onto, and therefore an isomorphism. So that's the blueprint. The first isomorphism theorem tells us that the image of a homomorphism is a copy of the factor group by the kernel of that homomorphism. Now, what is this homomorphism explicitly? Well, the way we would construct this is to say that if I pick any element G from my domain group over here, then there's a coset, GK, which consists of everything which can be obtained by composing together G with some element from the kernel. And so in our linear algebra picture, this was just this sort of parallel subspace. It's parallel to the kernel, but it's translated out by the element G. But because all the differences between elements inside of this coset are accounted for by elements of the kernel, when I apply phi to G, I'm going to get phi of G over here, and all the other elements that belong to this entire coset GK, all of them are going to get mapped to phi of G as well. And so the function which does this isomorphism sends the coset gk inside of the factor group. It sends it to the image phi of g of the element g. And so our job now is to figure out why is it always the case that this association of gk, the coset, to phi of g, the element, why does this give me an isomorphism always? Why is the factor group exactly isomorphic to the image of phi? That's what we want to do next, returning to plant our feet firmly into the group theory context.